I should say, welcome again to the Shepherd's Chapel. Here it is Friday evening, and what an anniversary for us. We complete our fourth week on live television. We just appreciate our Heavenly Father for the right of being able to fill this platform to share with you His Word. We're going to do something a little different this evening, and as much as we are between books and Monday evening, we're going to do the Rapture Theory, Fact or Fiction. Go into a little history about it. We've had an awful lot of questions uh, concerning uh, the serpent seed, uh, demons, etc. And I think tonight we're, ju- we're not going to take any particular subject. I'm just going to move around in the scriptures. We'll have them connected uh, and see if we can alleviate some of the anxieties concerning this subject. We're going to, incidentally also, we have some new 800 numbers added uh, to give you better service when you call a question in during the program. So we're going to try those out this evening, too. I'm going to have those numbers put up in just a moment. And any of you that might have a question related to that subject, uh, we're going to teach just a little bit this evening and go right into questions, let you take a bigger part in this Friday evening's service. Uh, Let's, let's talk about the serpent seed doctrine just a moment. Um, we ask our Father's blessings and understanding upon this subject in as much as it is an extremely controversial subject. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Why do people teach, or some, very few, but why do some teach this serpent seed doctrine? What, and first of all, what, is it, what am I saying? That the serpent of the garden has a seed upon this earth. And many are going to say right away, well, I heard that was a snake. You know, uh, And it shows our uh, inability to understand the knowledge God has put forth in His Word. Many times He spoke in figures of speech, metaphors, symbology, because it wasn't meant that all should know. I'll tell you why it is that I teach that there is a serpent seed on this earth, yes, even today. We're going to just go through a few scriptures here. I want, I want you, you're not going to have any scriptures at all on your screen this evening. I want you to get your own Bibles. Now, while, while I lead up to this, you go get it right now. You crack it open, and you that have a little dust on it, hey, polish her off, and let's don't let that dust pile up on there anymore, okay? Let's get her cleaned up, and let's go to his word. And I want you to read for yourself. We're going to begin in the 13th chapter of Matthew. Let's first find out, did Jesus teach this? Hey, if, D- if Jesus didn't teach a serpent seed, we shouldn't either. We probably shouldn't even entertain such a thought. For you see, his gospels are the gospel we're supposed to carry forward. I hope you learn from this 13th chapter why I do relate to a serpent seed, okay? Let's get into this 13th chapter of Matthew. First, he had told in verses 1 through 9, you're all familiar with it, the parable of the sowing, of the sower that went forth. And I'm sure where he told this story, he could probably look in a field and see a man with the with the broadcasting bag on his hip, probably, as he would reach in it and get a handful of grain and broadcast that type of sowing. We didn't have planters back in that time or, or drills as we do in this day and generation. That was called broadcasting. So, And the seed fell wherever they might when he would sling them, getting the coverage, if you would, of the sowing. And... The, the disciples, knowing that he was speaking in a parable, I want you to pick it up in the 10th verse of that 13th chapter of Matthew. And the disciples came and they said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why, why do you talk to these people in parables? Why don't you just plain old out lay it on them just like it is? All right, that's the reference. What is implied, rather. Verse 11. He answered and he said unto them, Because it is given unto you, this is his disciples, his students, to know the mysteries. Now, I want you to underline that in your mind. Not the milk, but it's not given unto them to know these mysteries. To the disciples it was. Let's begin again. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The mysteries of what? The kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, God, as it is written in Romans chapter 11, sent blindness upon many people for their own protection. For in 
ignorance, there is no sin. But his plan must be fulfilled. Call that, well, that's really not reasonable that Jesus would not want all people to have all the truth. Hey, if you loved someone and you had a truth and you knew that by the rules and regulations set up by Almighty God that they would fall short and he would have to destroy their soul. If you loved them, you would wait until a time of teaching was provided whereby they could come up to the standard of free will, total free will, without the great overpowering apostasy that is about to come upon this earth. Hey, those that God gives ears to hear concerning the serpent seed, have no, they will have no problem whatsoever in being tempted by Satan, for we don't find him tempting. We find him, uh, we abhor him. He's terrible. He's rotten to the core. I don't find a person like that. I don't care how beautiful he is in the form of Antichrist. That does not tempt me. My allegiance and love goes to Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, he that taught this parable. Now, he continues on in this 10th and 11th verse, explaining that parable to the disciples. And you're all familiar with it. We're not going into it. It is even stated in one of the Gospels that if you don't understand this parable of the sower, you're not going to understand the rest of his parables. He gives an addition, an extension, probably better said, to this parable of the sower concerning the kingdom of God in verse 24. Let's skip on to verse 24 in this 13th chapter of Matthew. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying... Now understand, this is a parable. He put this forth, and it has to do, verse 1 or uh, rather 24 and his first statement explains the kingdom of heaven in other words what is our subject the kingdom that is a king who has a dominion and that dominion is uh, the, of heaven All right, is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field that field beloved you're going to find out is this world God um, in that heaven his own kingdom for he is king sowed good seed, if you would, in that field which is the earth. Verse 25. Now remember again, I caution you, this is a parable. But while men slept, this means in the night, while men were looking the other way, his enemy came. Who's the enemy of God? I think all of you would know it's Satan, all right? And he sowed tares among the wheat and went, and went his way. Now, Jesus knew horticulture very well. Tares are what are called today zinua. All right, they, It looks exactly like wheat as it's growing. If you have it in a wheat field, you can hardly tell the difference between it and the wheat. But when the wheat matures, you have a rich golden grain that makes the bread of life, even if you would. But the zinua comes to a ripeness with a black, bitter seed and even toxic in some cases. Not fit for food. Not fit for anything. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. In other words, you could tell the difference when that old black fruit popped forth. That's why Jesus says, Know a tree by its fruit. 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, Didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? To God, didn't you sow good seed down on earth? From whence then are the tares, or hath it tares? Now I want you to know, God created all the peoples of this world he, in, in the creation of the days, and he liked it because they were his creation. You see, what upsets God is, is a hybrid that slips in. That is to say, Satan putting something somewhere where he is not. Uh, that is to say, like even the fallen angels, if you would, leaving their first habitation and coming here contrary to God's plan, producing hybrids which were geber in the Hebrew tongue, giants that did not belong, and for that reason God brought about the flood of Noah, you see. So 
understand what we're talking about in this parable. You should be able to figure it out in as much as the last couple of days we've been discussing the world that was this and the one that is coming, ages, that is to say. Continuing with verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. Period. All right? An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Shall we get in there and root them out? Verse 29. But he said, Nay, least while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. In other words, during the growing period, you could hardly tell the difference, and you might destroy some of the good children. That is to say, those that have option to salvation. Those that through Jesus Christ ultimately could have that salvation and understanding. One of them might be offended if you go in and destroy the wicked seed, the tare. Verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather... Now, who are these reapers? We'll find out in a moment. Gather you together first the tares. You take them out first. And bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. The Father is saying, Not one grain shall be lost, as it is written in Amos 9. All Israel shall be sifted as you would flour, and not one grain of that wheat lost. Uh, all those that believe upon Jesus of the nations, not one grain shall be lost. A promise from Almighty God. God is not a liar. He comes through on His promises. But the tares would be burned. And you know the beauty of it, beloved? You're going to find out that even if one of these tares believes upon Jesus, he has the power to even give them eternal life as it is written in Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Okay, he continues on with, a, with a, two more parables, but he's going to explain the one we just finished. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want you to take advantage of this, to understand the more in-depth teachings of Jesus. And a disciple is a student of Jesus. That's what disciple means. So I want you to be a student of Jesus and not listen to this man or any other man, but let Jesus speak to you through his word, for he lives in the word. He is the living word. Okay, verse 34, and we continue in that, okay? All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. In other words, to the large crowds, the mobs, he spoke in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. He just didn't give it to them on the line. 35, why? Your answer, beloved. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Don't you appreciate now those last two lectures so that you can understand what he's talking about? Things that have been kept secret since the foundation of this world. And as Gary so aptly explained to you from that appendix in the Companion Bible, the verb here, kibel, meaning that overthrow, meaning kept secret since Satan's first fall, for it was Satan that planted this wicked seed. So understand that. Verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away. Now follow closely what's happening. Jesus spoke nothing but in parables to the multitudes. But now he's sending that multitude away. And he went into the house. And his disciples, this is Jesus' students. Are you a student of Christ? Then listen to his word closely. His disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Jesus explained this to us. They hadn't followed it totally. He explained this. Now, beloved, this is paramount that you understand what I'm about to say. Jesus is about to explain a parable. He will not be speaking in a parable. In other words, these are facts that we're going to have explained to us, not something that is symbolism. Not something that is only symbolic of a thing whereby you must understand a parable, a proverb, or a riddle. He's going to lay it on the line to you. He's going to tell it like it is. Because he's speaking to his students. 
you might say to me, well, aren't you afraid right at this moment that someone um, that's not supposed to hear this, uh, when you explain it in this way, they won't hear it. Don't worry. They will not hear it. You can have all safety in that. They will not hear it. But if you're a student of his, you will. So listen closely as Jesus explains that parable. What is this wicked seed that was planted? Not a parable, but the straight fact. 37. He answered and he said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, meaning the Son of God, Almighty God, that Holy Spirit that moved upon the field, the earth. Verse 38. The field is the world. In other words, not heaven. The field is this earth, this earth age for you scholars. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. That's what the kingdom is about. Remember again, what does kingdom mean? The king and his dominion. Almighty God and his children. And these children, the good seed, are his children, those that he created. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, wait a minute. <clears throat> we don't believe in the Satan seed doctrine. We don't believe that there's any children on this earth other than what God put here. Anybody that would teach the serpent seed certainly doesn't know what they're talking about. For my Sunday school teacher told me that Eve partook of an apple. An apple on a tree. You know, Jesus is not a liar. He stated the wicked one sowed the seed. The seed in the Greek are children. Jesus says these are the children of the kingdom. The bad children are of the wicked one. Let's see if Jesus might make it a little clearer for us in verse 39. The enemy, that's this wicked one that sowed them, is the devil. The harvest... That's this harvest, is the end of the world. That means at the end, if you would, of the millennium. And the reapers are the angels, those that are God's messengers, God's servants. It is they. You don't have to reap it. Many might say, well, you, sometimes I think you teach hate. Hey, I don't have to bring about the destruction of anyone. Almighty God is quite able. And at the end of the millennium, it will be his time and his place. Again, any of these tares, what do they become if they accept Jesus? Sons of God. They're not tares any longer. They're not sons of the wicked one any longer. Now, do not spiritualize away because I made that statement, this entire thing. We're not speaking in a parable. We're not speaking in a spiritual sense. We are talking about literal seed children upon this earth. Satan sowed wicked seed upon this earth. If you will look up the word seed in the Greek as it is used to male sperma, you won't have any doubt at all. So let's tell it like it is. Okay, verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom, the king and his dominion, all things that offend, and them which do equity. 42. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire, that's that lake of fire that we all are familiar with, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Would Jesus teach that Satan planted seed upon this earth, that devil? Who is this devil and how dare you make a, 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 a uh, comparison between the devil, the wicked one, and the serpent? What time are we just speaking of? The millennium age and right at the end of it as it is written in Revelation chapter 20. Now again, I said, don't take my word. Let's take the word of Yeshua. Let's take the word of Jesus. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. In the Greek, this is literal. And he laid hold on that old dragon. Now you listen to these names. This is the wicked one. That old dragon. This is the role that Satan played in his downfall in the world that was. Revelation chapter 12. Documentation. And shall in the near coming and soon king of Babylon. The deceptor. Dragon. That old serpent. Hey, there it is. I'm not adding anything to this. 
which is the devil. In other words, the serpent is the devil. Oh, that's difficult, isn't it? That, you know, that is tough. That is really tough. Some people have a difficult time understanding a sentence like that. That old serpent, which is the devil. You know, you really, you should have a degree to absorb that. That's complicated. Should we teach a serpent seed? Oh my, no, that's not nice. Jesus did. Are you saying he's not nice? Come on, mature. And accept the teachings. Be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, don't hide your head in the sand and hide from a truth. Do you think Satan stops with that? No, he goes on and Satan and bound him a thousand. Those are just roles that that great cherubim Lucifer plays in fulfilling God's plan only as God allows. But Satan, that old serpent, planted seed upon this earth. I'll tell you what, while we're in the New Testament, let's go right on if we may to the 23rd chapter of this book of Matthew. Jesus was, this is the chapter of the woes, the eight woes which are the exact opposite of the eight Beatitudes, all right? He's talking to the hypocrites. Hypocrites in the Greek tongue means play actors, someone being something, someone playing a role, such as Satan. Here he's talking to Satan's children. Again, Jesus wouldn't teach that the, the serpent had a generation or an offspring. Of course not. That isn't nice, is it? Then don't call my Yahshua not nice. He is. He died for you. And you're not too good to listen to his word taught boldly and as he taught it. Verse 29 of that 30, 23rd chapter of Matthew, let me lay a little groundwork. Jesus opened this 23rd chapter by saying, The Pharisees and the scribes sit in the seat of Moses. Moses meaning the lawgiver, the one God spoke to as to how things should be. And he continues on, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you play actors. <clears throat> because you build the tombs of the prophets. You kill them and build their graves, in other words. And garnish the sepulchres of the righteousness. 30. And you say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Oh, we're, you know, we're too nice for that. We, wouldn't have, we would not have done that. Now, beloved, first of all, understand this. It is the serpent seed. It is certainly not those scribes and Pharisees that were of Judah. And, and you just take... The, that's what causes a great deal of um, misunderstanding between Judah and the other houses of Israel. His people are not intelligent enough to know the difference between a Kenite and a, and a Judaite. Because they cannot discern the spirit. For the Kenite is the offspring, it simply means the sons of Cain, who was of his father the devil. We'll prove that further in a moment. All right? They said, we wouldn't have done that. Verse 31. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourself that ye are the children, that's offspring, of them which kill the prophets. Because ye lie that way, you witness to your own self, he's saying. Fill ye up, then, the measure of your fathers. It's real clear. He says the bloodline is there and the Spirit still flows through you. Remember, this is Jesus speaking, not me, beloved. I'm simply teaching his word to his students. Uh, 33. Ye serpents. Who was again the father of these? The serpent seed? Well, the serpent doesn't have seed on earth. Uh, that isn't nice. That's a no-no. Who was that serpent again? The devil. Wake up. It's not that difficult, friend. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? By believing upon the one that was speaking to them, beloved. This word generation is not in the manuscripts. That shows you how the little scribes hanky-panky with the translation. Those of you that have are fortunate enough where they're out of print. I wonder why they were taken out of print, the Strong's Concordances with the, uh, the, um, the commentary of, uh, the, of word changes. 
which is called the, that part of the concordance that lets you know when a word was changed, an English reader. Comparative concordance, it is called. Now, someday, if, if I'm able, I'm going to reprint the Strong's Concordance in its original form and never allow the scribes to hanky-panky with that particular edition. For this word generation is offspring in the Greek manuscripts. I said offspring, meaning progeny. Now let's read it the way the manuscripts and the way it came from Jesus' mouth. Ye serpents, ye offspring of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. You're going to do it. That's what he's saying. 35. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Now there's your clue, beloved, if you're thinking. Who slew Abel? Cain, the first offspring of the serpent. Righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias. Okay? Oh, Jesus wouldn't really say that, would he? Jesus really wouldn't say that the devil was their father. He really wouldn't. T he surely meant that in a spiritual sense. No, he did not. As in the 13th chapter, he was not explaining a parable. Uh, rather, speaking in a parable, he was explaining one, and you cannot take away from that. Who was this Abel then? Who, or rather, the murderer of Abel? Turn with me where Jesus is teaching again in the 8th chapter of St. John, and let's understand a little more about this murderer. There were some Eudas, this is of Judah, and also residents of Judea. There were no doubt some Kenites that had slipped in among this that believed upon him. And Jesus said, hey, learn the truth, and the truth will make you free. Verse 42 in this 8th chapter of St. John. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, oh, hey, here we're talking about the sower of that good seed again, aren't we? You would love me, for I proceedeth forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. 44, ye are of your father the devil. Hey, that's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? Well, he's spiritualizing. No, he isn't. It's a very simple statement. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. This is Cain, and the devil being the father thereof. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie. He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Who was the father of the first lie in this earth age? Open your eyes, beloved. Open your ears. Who first lied in this earth age? Read Genesis 3, where the serpent says to Eve, Oh, it doesn't matter what God said. In the day you eat thereof, surely you'll be made wise. She was brought about death, rather. Now open your eyes and your ears to the teachings of Jesus and let it simplify his overall plan. The world age that was this and the one that's coming. And also the enemies of Israel, Judah, and the other nations of the world. As they are Satan's own. Fulfilling the negative part of God's plan. Are you to hate them or are you to destroy them? You leave the terrors alone. I said again, you leave the terrors alone. They are doing a very excellent job of fulfilling the negative part of God's plan. And those that have eyes to see and ears to hear and are God's elect and have studied in his word know what they're about to do next, whereby they can prepare mentally, spiritually, and physically to sustain themselves therein. Jesus continues in 45, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. In other words, it's too difficult for some to accept this simple truth. Which of you convinceth me of sin? Which one of you can say I'm a liar or that I have sinned? Jesus speaking. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. In other words, God didn't create you. You're a hybrid. You were a seed planted by one fallen from another place. 
That's what Jesus is telling them. That's why in Jude chapter 6 that those angels are locked in chains for destruction on that day when that negative part of God's plan is finished. I'm going to go one more place. Uh, rather than go to Genesis 3, let's let, we've been in the New Testament. Um, where do I want to go? I want to go to Corinthians. Let's go to chapter 11 and verse 3. No, I'm sorry. Chapter 11, Paul says here, though it says in English, bear with me a little in my folly. What it really says in Greek, I want to talk to you about something very serious. Verse 2, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. This means Christians, believers. For I have espoused you to one husband. That husband, of course, is Jesus. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I don't want you falling off the way on the road to me, your husband, okay? But I fear, I'm really worried, least by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve. Do you know what this word beguiled is in the Greek? You with Strong's Concordance, look up the Greek in your Greek dictionary. If you know numbers, look, go where it says 1818. 1,000. 180 and, and 18, rather. 1818, okay? You go there. It's excitio, which means to wholly seduce. Paul says, I want to talk to you about something very serious. The serpent wholly seduced Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. They can't understand the simple teachings of Jesus. This is why Jesus said again in Matthew 24, It shall be as it was in the days of Noah. They shall be both giving and taking in marriage. Marriage with who? Fallen angels and Geber were the offspring thereof. I know this offends some, but some can't understand the simple truth in the way Jesus taught it, the way Paul brought it forth. Beloved, I, I stated I wasn't going to teach that long. I, we just got going and kept going. We're going to stop there and just throw the telephones open and, and, uh, and take your questions at this time. I want Gary to share something with you, though, meanwhile. Gary? In the Companion Bible, uh, Arnold has been talking about Genesis 3 most of the week. He's been talking about the serpent. He's been talking about the world that was. And I'd like to let you know how important it is for you to possess the Companion Bible. With just a $100 donation or more, you can have this beautiful leather-bound book. But the appendix is well worth the money. For a $100 donation, we'd like to share this with you. Again, I'd like to go to the appendix tonight. Appendix 19. This appendix has to do with the serpent of Genesis 3. And think about it. Does it really make sense to call Satan a serpent? He's called that in the Bible, but does it really make sense to think of him as a snake hanging from a tree? Let me read this to you in the back of the companion Bible. When Satan is spoke of as a serpent, it no more means a snake than it does when Dan is so called in Genesis 49.17. In 49.17, Dan also was called a serpent. But we don't call him a snake. We don't think of him that way. Now let's continue. Or an animal when Neo is called a lion in 2 Timothy 4.17. Or when Herod is called a fox, Luke 13, 32. Or when Judah is called a lion's whelp. Now think about it. Does it make sense to think of Satan as a snake hanging out of a tree with an apple in his mouth trying to deceive somebody? You know, you owe it to your children, your family, your loved ones, your neighbor. God has called out people to help, people to teach. He's reaching out to you right now, giving you an opportunity to help your people. Learn what the serpent is. Learn what the book of, that God has compiled for us through better than 4,000 years it took him to do it. Learn what's in that word. Learn what you need to do to prepare your family for these end times. Order a companion Bible. It's a, it's a big help to you. It's a tool that you need one of the basic tools you need in your house, one of the first ones you need. 
again, we'd like to share that Bible with you for a $100 donation. Now get on the phones and call your questions in. I know that many of you have questions that you haven't called in. Questions on everyone's mind as they go through the book. It don't matter if you read one verse, you've got a question. The phone call costs you nothing. Also order the Mark of the Beast tape. It's free. Learn that the barcode, the computer, all those tattoos. You know, as long as you stay in that kind of a study, you're doing exactly what Satan wants you to do. You're paying attention to that garbage instead of studying God's Word. You need to get into His Word and set your children a foundation that will carry them through the rest of their life. Order that Mark of the Beast tape. It's free. The phone call is free. Ask for the, the uh, tape list. Ask for it. There's many, many studies in it that will help you to prepare your family. We thank you for your support and your prayers. Arnold. Thank you, Gary, for sharing those words with us. God bless you. Hey, let's get those phones cracking. we got some new lines tonight. I want to try them out. Are you going to cooperate? Those of you that have a question, you know I've only got a few here. I'm going to show you how quick I can work these out, hopefully. Let's, let's see if you can snow the old teacher tonight, all right? Some of you trip me up. Um, ask me something that we can't answer, all right? There's no gimmicks. I've studied God's Word for 35 years, and I'm certainly not saying I know everything. But try me, all right? Let's, let's get into God's Word. Let's study in depth, okay? Let's get going then. Barbara, would you clarify the subject of age of accountability? She heard one has to be a certain age to go to heaven, or what is the... Uh, procedure pertaining to age. Nothing. As a matter of fact, Jesus said you must become as a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. A little child in all its innocence, if it dies, goes immediately to the Father who gave it. When does, when does the soul enter that flesh body? At conception. It was at Jesus' conception that Mary approached Elizabeth and John, who was six months in Elizabeth's womb jumped because John felt the presence of God in that conception itself. What I'm saying is, even in this earth age where we have many abortions, there's already a soul in that child, but it, in its innocence, goes instantly back to the Father, saying what? That soul got almost a free ride through this earth age into the kingdom. Am I saying that that should make us hasten to uh, increase abortion? Of course not. I'm simply saying Jesus loves the little children. He protects them whether man does or not. Okay, uh, I hope that answers your question. Marie, would you clarify if Satan was thrown out, of the, out to the earth because of his rebellion in Genesis 1 and 2? Okay, number one. Satan has not yet been cast to the earth. Satan shall be cast to the earth as Antichrist in the very near future. Documentation, just before the seventh trump in the book of Revelation. We're going to be getting there within just a week or two for following the Monday and Tuesday's discussion on the rapture theory, we're going to begin that great book of the unveiling. It is then, it is only his demonic spirits, which is to say the spirit of the wicked one, that is able to come to this earth now. But he shall be coming soon. That same old serpent that was in the garden with his bands of angels to seduce again the daughters of men. And I speak in a spiritual sense there, beloved. Are you mentally prepared or are you looking for a barcode? Are you looking for three sixes on the forehead or how stupid do you think Satan is? Come on, let's get with it. It says, in the mind, he's going to deceive many. Betty, I want you to explain the statement on Genesis 19 tape where you say, and this is from uh, my commentary in cassette tapes on the book of Genesis, if you give people more truth than they should hear, that it, would, it will do them injury. Uh, I make this statement to cause that one of God's elect to think when they stop when they continue to hammer at a person that does not understand the events, as a matter of fact, that we were just been covering. For the simple reason, you must plant a seed and let it grow in that person's soul, in that person's mind. Therefore, do not just snow them under and make them accountable if that were possible and it is not for something they could not bear up to. Lorraine, wants to not want you to explain why it says 144,000 
5,000 men and doesn't mention women. Okay, uh, Lorraine, in this particular case, there is no gender. What do I mean by that? When the 144,000 overcome, uh, there is no gender in as much as they sing the new song when we're all changed to that new body then they are virgins even though they fall for a moment to Antichrist in the new body they are virgins for they know Antichrist and shall never bow to him this goes for the kings and queens as well it is written in the book of Joel and in Acts chapter 2 that both sons and daughters, so you women are going to take part in this spiritual battle against the Antichrist that is coming up very soon. Prepare yourself. Uh, many of you are far stronger in spirit than many men, I know. Uh, loves your program uh, and heard you on radio. Say so you. That's been quite a few years ago. Okay, June. 1 Thessalonians 5.3, when they say peace and safety, could it be that, that that scripture has already come to pass? No, it could not. That is the peace and safety that shall be said when we go into one worldism. For in the following verse it says, Then sudden, sudden destruction. We shall not see, we are hearing the rumors thereof, but it has not yet come to pass. Peace and safety shall be when we are dwelling in a one world political system. That's the first piece of Revelation 13. Now let's keep those phones going. I'm just about to get to tonight's questions. We're going to get them answered, so you keep them busy, all right? I want to make sure that all of those new lines that are installed are working, so keep those questions coming. Viola, if you raise a child in the way of God, he shall not depart the way. Can we hold God responsible for the promise? God many times intercedes in a child's life, yes. He did not say, he said they won't depart it ultimately spiritually. Though many of us sin, deep down in that spiritual sense, we do not part that way. Meaning what? They have the road map back to the path. They'll find it. You trust him. Have faith in him. Don't question him. Don't question him, for his promise is true. Okay, uh, Beth. Ezekiel 28, Satan and what he looks like, a cherubim, the anointed cherubim. How can he be an anointed cherub and be the serpent also? <clears throat> he was not the serpent when he was the anointed cherubim as the king. He had not fallen yet. It is when he is the prince in the first part of Ezekiel 28 that he has fallen. It is Isaiah chapter 14 after his fall where he is that morning star that fell that deceived the people no his roles completely change from that place he uh, if you read Ezekiel 28 in the final part concerning the king of Tyre it makes it very clear that his own pride his own uh, self-importance caused him to fall was the garden of God Eden yes I recommend that many of you that do not believe the trees that were partaken of were people and and this very question was the garden of God Eden I would recommend that you read Ezekiel chapter 31 where God speaks to Pharaoh saying hey who do you think you're not uh, are look at the box elder I know in the English it will say Asha Asha was not in the garden of Eden it is box elder for Satan always tried to be a cedar of Lebanon and then it goes into the God's people in the garden, the Garden of Eden, and the deception that took place there. It'll do you well to read Ezekiel 31. Okay, uh, Mildred wants to know if her husband has to give up smoking and can she wear makeup and jewelry. We know at this time that, that smoking certainly is not good for one. It is not a sin, certainly unto death. We can assure you of that. For a sin unto death is um, to deny the Holy Spirit. As far as women ma wearing makeup and jewelry, there are many traditions of man that just really get in the way of God's work. I don't know why he puts up with it. Let's say, for example, one thing that is brought upon women is they must keep their heads covered at all times in church. You know what this really comes from? Paul was saying, women keep your head covered for because of the angels. He was using a figure of speech concerning the angels that seduced the daughters of Adam all the way back into Genesis 6, those fallen angels. He was softening people to the point, hey, they're coming again. And he was using that as an example. Only in that sense, we are all in the feminine gender for the simple fact uh, that we are the bride of Christ. Okay, Steve Moore. Uh, I'm just going to read the whole name so I won't say the town. Ethnos. 
Ethnos is a Greek word which means ethnic or nations, okay? How the sins, um, how the something nature was transmitted to them. How the sins nature, okay, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty reading this. How would they fall not having been in the grave when human life um, computed at birth or conception? Okay. When does sin nature reside, call on soul, or where? <laughs> uh, okay, let's try, let's try to get your thought here. Um, how would relate to, how would this, I would say, relate to sin nature in own life structure? Um, ethnos. I really, I, I'm sorry, I, I wish I could have taken this, uh, I, I cannot, this is so, uh, we'll have one more try at it. How the sin nature was transmitted to them. Oh, to the, to the Gentile, okay. How would they fall not having been in the garden. Okay, well, the garden is the world, and when they're in the world, when human life computed at birth or conception, it begins at conception, as stated earlier. Where does sin nature reside? It resides, of course, in the inner man, I mean the outer man, the flesh man. Flesh is sin. Uh, the Gentile, of course, is as accountable in Christ as anyone else is, uh, except for uh, those duties that God set aside. They are not necessarily uh, uh, to come totally under nature, that is to say, if they accept Christ, and they are, they're, the standards are the same for their salvation is the same. I feel that I missed probably the main part of your thought there, so I'll just recap that real quickly. The Gentile peoples who accept Jesus Christ are under, if you would, more or less the same restrictions that even an Israelite is, in as much as in Christ, in Christ, he forgives your sins as well as he forgives the sins of Israel. I think I'll leave that one there. Okay, Stephen. The people you witness to about Antichrist, are they sealed and why and how? Scripture. Well, not necessarily. Uh, God causes the seed to grow. The 144,000, as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 44 for your scripture and documentation, shall all bow a knee to Antichrist. I'll say that again. The 144,000 shall all bow a knee to Antichrist, for they are the Levitical priests that go astray when Israel does. The, the Levitical priesthood of the Zadok, Zadok meaning the just, from which comes the word Melchizedek, Okay? God's elect. They shall not bow a knee. But these 144,000, when they are sealed in their forehead, when they hear the elect witness against Antichrist after the fact, then they will say, this person told me the truth. In other words, as I witness to you now that Antichrist is coming before we gather back to Christ, I tell you it is a fact. All right? I am delivered up before Antichrist, and that trial is televised to the world. And we're, when you hear me refute him by Christ speaking through me, as it is written in Mark 13, that would have been sealed into your forehead, for something is not a prophecy unless it is spoken before the fact, not after the fact. Then the 144,000 come out. So it is difficult. We're going to have to wait a while and see if they are sealed or not, okay? But don't be discouraged continue on. Let the seed grow. Margaret. How the evil seed got past the flood. Okay. That's a good question. It is stated in Genesis chapter 6 that all men became flesh. Noah was told to take two of every flesh, not animals now, two of every flesh aboard the ark. Now that would be one way. The other way is simply that I do not believe that the flood was worldwide. Cain went to the land of Nod, which if you pick up any World Book Encyclopedia Dictionary, the large volumes, two volumes, look up the word Kenite, K-E-N-I-T-E, which in the Hebrew tongue simply says the sons of Cain. You will find they went to, say, approximately Mongolia, and it is there where he took his wife, uh, 
Okay. Uh, uh, to prove and document that they did go past the flood, open your Bibles to First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, and you will see there where the Kenites were already the scribes, the same scribes Jesus was talking to a moment ago in, in Matthew 23. They were tagged on to the end of Judah's genealogy, but they were Kenites, K-E-N-I-T-E's, of the house of Rechab, which is the way you trace them, documenting in God's word that Cain's children made it quite healthily through the flood, okay? Uh, Gary, uh, if, you, if you want to make a deeper study on that, uh, I'll be offering a book in the near future that using our own history and the history of, uh, of, of the Oriental peoples will we'll give better documentation. Gary, how is the seed uh, reflected now in the world by makeup uh, rock groups? Now, let me just let me just back up here. How is the seed reflected now in the world by makeup rock groups? Uh, I think probably your question to the call the, to the telephone person wasn't made. Or they didn't really understand because I, I'm going to just take a stab at this. I'm going to say probably what you were asking is how is the seed that is the evil seed I presume reflected? How does it show itself? now in the world uh, in makeup or would we recognize it could it be rock groups I'm going to assume that that's what you were asking okay no Satan uses many tools mass uh, hypnosis is one of them heavy metal is not the best and most healthy thing in the world but it is not the Kenites. It is not the bad seed. They are far more intelligent than that. They practically control this world in power at this moment. Jesus speaks of them in Revelation 2.9 when he says they claim to be of Judah, but they're not. They're a bunch of liars. They're of the synagogue of Satan. Now don't pick on my brother Judah or take it out on him for the statement I made or the statement that Christ made in that Revelation 2.9. But be mature enough to know it is the mark placed upon Cain by Almighty God, and it is a spiritual mark. And if you have the gift of discerning spirits, which any Christian that is of God's elect does, you'll recognize them. They utilize hard rock, which goes into drugs, hallucina uh, hallucination, this sort of thing, which weakens by toxins in the system, ones build up to demonics and gives them free range. But it is not the Kenite. The Kenite is far too intelligent for that. He's, you, you must be wiser than the serpent. Recognize them spiritually. Alex, does our church believe in the rapture? I, uh, Alex, I hope by our church that you feel a part of this church. We believe definitely in a gathering back to Jesus Christ. But it will be after the tribulation of Antichrist. You see... We will gather back to Jesus before God's great day of wrath or at the very beginning, the early morning hour of it. Uh, not to mention an hour of day. I'm speaking spiritually in a sense, okay? But we will live through the tribulation of Antichrist. How great. Uh, I look forward to it. Hey, it's going to be a great time to be able to truly witness for Jesus and with the gospel armor on to see who's Christian and who's taken up in the great apostasy. Monday we'll be getting into that rapture theory. You'll get a lot closer look at it from God's word. Uh, Lorraine, how did Noah get all the animals on the ark, and how did he control them? Noah only took on the ark those domestic animals that were named before Adam. The other, the wild beast and animals, were created on the sixth day. On Adam, God created the domestic animals, much that we have today, and uh, that part that God did want on that ark, truly it was there. God is in control and um, it, was, it was a five-month period, and uh, a man that is good with animals has no problem with that, especially where there was a divine intervention. That ark was symbolic in a sense. I'm saying it was real, but it was symbolic of the ark of the five months that Antichrist shall be reigning on this earth in Revelation chapter 9. You must be in that ark of truth 
to live through this flood of Satan's lies that will come from his mouth as a flood in Revelation chapter 12 after the woman, that is to say, Christ's bride. Okay? Is it true that only God can read our thoughts and Satan can only do what God allows? Basically, yes. But if you let Satan know what you're doing, you'd better be prepared because he's going to be there at the gate unless you have the power and know how to exercise the power in Christ. Okay, one more, and then we're going to stop. Luther, do you think this is the generation that the Antichrist is coming, or when? Absolutely, beyond any shadow of a doubt. That is made very clear by Jesus in Mark 13, where he stated, when you see... He's speaking of Antichrist. The entire chapter is addressed to Antichrist. When you see the fig tree planted in Jerusalem, know that that generation will not pass away until all these things, that meaning Antichrist, is complete. So yes, uh, this is that generation. And bless your hearts, we're going to have the privilege of standing against him together. Beloved, just uh, here I've gone down to one minute, and I wanted to share with you, hey, I signed that big um, loan today for our uplink that big trumpet, $150,000. We have one year to raise that in. You're all intelligent enough to know that I don't want to go to jail, but I have faith to know, and, and, and I jest in a way. I know the Father is going to allow it. But at the same time, if we teach you and you enjoy us coming into your home, help us pay for this uplink whereby we can share this time with you, won't you? Hey, you get on the telephone, let us know how you enjoy... Line-by-line -line study of God's...